Um, I've been working in the field of what we call XR now for about 30 years, started with uh, Disney early on, even a startup before that, and um, had the opportunity to contribute at Microsoft on the HoloLens and Amazon on Echo Frames and Apple on things I can't talk about, um, and also helped start um, Keyhole, which turned into Google Earth and worked on Second Life. So I've kind of been all over the place and worked on a little bit of this and that and have interest in, in all of it. Uh, you can kind of think of me as a, as a um, computer architect and designer. Uh, and so I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. And, and one of the things that I like to say is I, I understand all the people who are coming at this new because I remember 30 years ago when I came at this new and was very excited. But just remember that I've had 30 years of, of you know, getting arrows in my back and bloodied and trying everything and seeing what works and doesn't work. So I'm kind of coming from the voice of, of, of good and bad experience at this. So what I what I um, saw about you used a bunch of the, uh, the quotes from things that I've I've written and it would take way more than five minutes to even just to read the quotes that you included. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize in just a few bits and pieces uh, of, of what I was trying to say. So the first thing I guess is when people say the metaverse is the fusion of the digital and the physical worlds, they're mainly talking about AR, right? They, Snow Crash's original metaverse, when, it, when he coined the term, was 99% VR. The headset could actually do AR, but nobody used it because reality was really bad. So everybody spent their time in VR because reality was so horrible, um, even though they could have done AR. But what, what AR is really about, I think, and what's important about it and why it's relevant to us is that it's really about how we interact with computers, reality, and other people all at the same time. It's this interface between all three. And, and VR is still important, it's, it's valuable, but it's about anything else. It's about anything other than the here and now, which is great for escapism and meetings and creativity, things like that, um, exploring other worlds. But the reality is I think we're gonna live fluidly between them. We're gonna see devices coming out even next month that can switch between AR and VR. So it's never all one thing, uh, but my kind of annoyance with the term metaverse, I don't know how to really describe this well, except to say it's akin to hearing somebody say that the solution to gender diversity and misogyny is to call everyone men. It, it's not really the solution to call everything the metaverse. There are differences among these things and the differences matter. That's why we have unique words like AR and VR to describe some of those differences and calling it all the same, I think uh, sort of hides the facts of, of what's important here. So AR has always been the future of computing and interaction. I think it's been that way since the beginning and a lot of people are more excited about VR. I was more excited about VR initially. I thought the internet had to be 3D to take off, but uh, clearly it didn't. Um, but I think the future of AR is really that we see holograms of, of each other. The people that we care about can be with us when we want them, even when they're not physically present. And it'll feel much more natural, I think, than anything else we've imagined. And even smart devices will have AR interfaces. This computer screen basically disappears and the world becomes our, our canvas. That to me feels much more natural as a vision. Uh, now, some people talk about wanting to live in VR, and this is where I start to have some concerns, uh, because it's a form of escapism for some people, I think. It's, it's akin to maybe easier than living on Mars, right? But it's about getting away from the, the restrictions of the world that we don't like. Uh, and the answer is, the question is, are we ready yet? Are we, are we ready for that? And I think, judging by the fact that we can barely live together on Twitter today without blocking people, and that's all just text, I'd say, no, we're probably not ready for that yet because the, the levels of power we have over each other are gonna be so magnified in, in virtual worlds that uh, we, need, we need much more maturity. We need much more empathy for other people to be able to live in that space together, even to get the benefits of all the things that we want. Um, for an example, um, I, I worked on a, uh, I wrote a patent anyway, I almost can't talk about any details, but I wrote a patent for how would you block people in VR? Like, how would you actually deal with people who are harassing them other than these bubbles and things that we do today? And, and it turns out if you want to treat it the way Twitter does, which is you can block people and they disappear from your timeline, in, in a physical virtual space, uh, that would be really weird because not only would the person disappear, but all their contributions would disappear. If they, had, if they had built the floor you were standing on, that would disappear. So we wind up with something much more like a consensual reality where everybody just sees only what they agree to see and that becomes very hard to reconcile. So the world itself becomes very hard to imagine how it's gonna work when everybody is so super powered and, and, and filter bubbles become the least of our ways at that point. Uh, it's not unsolvable, 
But if you look at the state of things today, a lot of people working on the metaverse, the virtual side, are still busy recreating and solving problems from 20 years ago, the second life in Star Wars Galaxies had to solve. We, we haven't evolved past most of those things yet. We've added a whole bunch of new requirements uh, about ownership and things like that, um, but, but we haven't even solved the core of the interactions. I think so we have a lot of work to do. And I think first and fo foremost, we need to bring into these worlds, and this is true for AR as well, is, is real empathy, real seeing each other as, as people. Even the word avatar hides the fact that some fraction of the virtual people we see are real people with real emotions that we can very easily trample. And giving people superpowers, I think, makes it more likely that we will trample each other. We'll have it be much easier to do so. Just look at road rage, given cars, how easy it is for people to take out their aggressions on each other. Um, and it's not that we need you know, ultra realism in, in, in humans or we wanna blame the victims of the harassment for the abuse for being there in the first place. And neither one of those is, is the case. But being represented like a video game character, is that really helping us to see each other as people? What we need to do is really treat the so-called empathy machine uh, in a way that it's going to really create empathy and, and treat people as people. Okay, so let's, another thing I talked about was, was privacy in the ad model. So switching gears just a little bit in, 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 in the, to the, for the sake of time. Uh, the big, big red flags that we have is that we are about to have a near future. Facebook is, Meta is about to release a product that likely has eye tracking reportedly. And uh, other biometric sensors have already been out for a while, but it, you've written a lot about eye tracking and, and the problems with it. And I think a lot of people get concerned and they want to regulate the technology. And what I, what I come at it is, let's not regulate the ads. Let's not regulate the tech first. We will if we have to, but what we should regulate is the business models. The business models that say right now that it's okay to abuse our privacy for, for profit. It shouldn't be okay. It should frankly be, illegal for a company to collect information about us and then use it against us. Uh, we should, on the other hand, we should encourage companies to safely use the data they collect. The biometric data is valuable and useful, but they should be using it for our benefit. Like when your watch tells you to see a doctor, that's for the benefit of, of the wearer and something we should value and protect if, if people choose it. Uh, and protecting from third party access like hackers or governments is also in our best interest. So the security of the data is really important. Right now, the ad tech companies are acting like giving us better ads is some kind of a mitzvah, like, you know, like that's what we all really want and need. But if that was true, we'd all turn it back on on our iPhones. And I think most of us have, have privacy turned on instead. Uh, the, the claim is that the, daily, the data is freely co collected while we're in, like we're in public places, but that's not true anymore. The, when we go on these sites, everything's now encrypted. Everything is really much more of a private space. And they also claim that we've consented to giving this data when we join, but that's not true either because nobody reads the terms of service. The companies know we don't read the terms of service. It's, it's, a, it's a sham. So we need to really revisit this. And it's, it's this, this greedy lie of saying that we all are doing this because we want it, it's, it's just gotta stop. If some people want it, great, they can, they can opt in for, for ads that, you know, that give them information. Personally, I'd rather pay for a site like Consumer Reports that tells me which products are good and which products are bad rather than living in a world of, of self-motivated advertising. But the, the danger now is that the eye gaze, eye gaze data that we're about to be giving over to the companies is so much more compelling in terms of being able to not only pick the ads that we see, but manipulate us into watching the ads and into believing the ads uh, and iterating through our likes in the world are essentially a form of mind reading. Now is the time we really, really need to start uh, regulating the, the use of this technology and how it's used uh, against us. And the final thing that I'm going to say, I'm over five minutes or not, stop me if I go too long, but this will just be a couple of sentences. Um, we need to think about how we design these products. I think that one of the, while we may need regulation and we certainly need standards and a lot of other work needs to happen, one of the things I think is missing and one of the things that this, this new XR Guild that we're working on is trying to solve is to help raise the level of mentoring and education among all the makers of metaverse and XR technology, all the developers and writers and artists, designers, PMs, even the CEOs, trying to raise the level of understanding around what is ethical and what is in the interest of our, of our users and how to design properly. Some companies do spend a lot of time thinking about that and other companies seem to be continually surprised at how much people hate what they do. Uh, and I think we can help raise that level of understanding. They just don't teach this well enough uh, in school and I think we need to go back and actually help with that level of education. So we've started this thing called the XR Guild that is meant to help with that.